We all are familiar with disease, whether we fight a nasty cold or spend a few nights in the hospital. This is my sick friend Terence, who is about to go on an unplanned adventure. And right now, he has a serious infection. Today, when we catch an illness, we usually get better. When we have surgeries, they heal. That wasn't always the case. What if Terence lived in the past? Let's travel back in time and find out how pioneering research shed light on an unknown world. There was a time when pestilence and plague roamed the streets and death seemed eager to follow. Cities had no running water or sewers. Illnesses crept into overcrowded tenements. And people blamed bad air, which they called miasmas. If Terence walked by a swamp and suddenly fell ill, he would have been carted home and given herbs or had a vein cut to remove excess blood. The 1600s set the stage for the development of modern medicine. Robert Hooke coined the term cell. That's huge. He devised a compound microscope that allowed him to see an invisible world. When he looked at cork, he saw tiny compartments that reminded him of a monk's cell. His detailed drawings inspired a scientist named Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who observed tiny living organisms. Leeuwenhoek built a single lens microscope with such superior magnification that he saw lice, protozoa, sperm, blood cells, and bacteria. Pushed toward the 1700s, Terence finds himself in England during a smallpox epidemic. Here, Edward Jenner created the first vaccine. He infected a boy with cowpox, then smallpox, scientifically testing an old wives' tale. While unethical today, back then, the alternative was much worse. The boy didn't show any symptoms, so Jenner inoculated others and named the procedure vaccination. This eventually led to the eradication of smallpox. Incredible! Leeches, herbs, and bloodletting were still common practice, though. So Terence rolls on to the 1800s. Here we meet Ignaz Semmelweis, the first person to institute handwashing in hospital wards. Women were dying of fever after childbirth at an alarming rate. And Semmelweis was truly puzzled. When his friend and colleague was cut during an autopsy, he contracted the same fever and died. The illness wasn't limited to pregnant women. This was an illuminating moment for Semmelweis. Doctors often went straight from morgue to maternity ward, and he believed tiny particles were passing from one to the other. He immediately instituted hand washing. The results were phenomenal, and when he washed medical instruments, mortality fell even further. Sadly, Semmelweis wasn't recognized in his lifetime, and his work was largely forgotten. Next, we find John Snow, who tracked the source of a cholera outbreak to a water pump. He believed self-replicating organisms were contaminating food or water and causing cholera. People didn't believe him either. So when cholera broke out in Soho, London, Snow tracked down the name and address of every victim. He plotted the deaths on a map and noticed a cluster around the Broad Street pump. He investigated why some places near the well had no deaths and some places far from the well did. Although skeptical, the Board of Governors removed the pump handle so no one could get water from that well, and the outbreak ended. For this incredible work, he is considered the father of epidemiology. You might recognize Louis Pasteur from the process of pasteurization. More importantly for Terence, he contributed to the germ theory, or the idea that microorganisms cause disease. Quite revolutionary for people still believed in miasmas as well as spontaneous generation. Pasteur boiled beef broth in two types of flasks. The open ones spoiled, and the closed ones didn't. With spontaneous generation discredited, miasmas were next. Pasteur boiled broth in swan-necked flasks, open to the air, 
the bent neck trapped any particulates and the broth didn't spoil. But the miasma theory was not so easily laid to rest. The final blow came from Robert Koch, a scientist whose postulates determine whether a specific organism causes a certain disease. Anthrax was common among farm animals who had Bacillus anthracis in their spleens. To prove this bacterium did in fact cause anthrax, Koch extracted the spleen from a sheep and plated the cells. Once he had a pure culture, one in which only the Bacillus was growing, he infected some mice. They contracted the disease and died. He examined their spleens and found the same Bacillus that killed the sheep. These steps became Koch's postulates. We use a modified version of them today. You remember Semmelweis? Maternity ward, hand washing? Yeah, no one else did either. And despite proof of the germ theory, surgeries remained deadly. So much so that there was a talk of completely banning them. Enter Joseph Lister. He used antiseptic techniques to successfully treat compound fractures. Clean wounds often healed, so Lister believed something in the air caused infection. He tested his theory on compound fractures where the bone breaks the skin. Lister treated the wounds with carbolic acid, then covered them in acid-soaked lint. The patients healed and mortality rates dropped. Because of this, Lister is considered the father of modern surgery. He was so inspirational, the inventors of Listerine named it after him. Around the same time, we find Carlos Finlay helping the U.S. study yellow fever in Cuba. They concluded that it was transmitted by an agent in the air. Finlay went on to propose it was a blood-borne pathogen spread by mosquitoes. The history tends to repeat itself, and once again, revolutionary ideas were dismissed. As Terence bounces into the 1900s, we head to a hospital ward in Cuba. During early wars, infection and gangrene caused more deaths than the fighting. In fact, it wasn't until World War II that battle fatalities outweighed those from disease. Enter Major Walter Reed, who discovered incubation periods or the time it takes for a disease to become contagious. Yellow fever decimated troops, and after the Spanish-American War, Reed arrived to study it. In the process of discovering incubation periods, he proved that mosquitoes carry yellow fever. Today we know that organisms called vectors can infect us. Flies, fleas, mosquitoes, ticks, and kissing bugs are all examples. When we look in a microscope, we see a whole new world, animal cells with their nucleus and other organelles, plant cells with their thick walls and chloroplasts, bacteria with their DNA and plasmids, viruses with their protein coats and nucleic acids. We know that bacteria self-replicate. We also know that viruses rely on cells like ours to multiply. Once their genetic material and protein coats are copied, they rupture our cells, bursting into our bodies. Each new virus infects another cell and another cell and another cell, activating our immune system and starting a chain of events. Multitudes of cells join the battle, fighting to rid our system of intruders. Some of the cells release antibodies that attach to the viral proteins. A macrophage then ingests the marked viruses one by one and breaks them down. Terence had quite the adventure bouncing through time. He will heal because each of these scientists, as well as countless others, question the world around them. Their pioneering research and remarkable discoveries shaped how we practice modern medicine. Their stories echo around us as the scientists of today continue illuminating disease.